to lay. A barren land of ice looms from the frozen seas in the Arctic Circle, awaiting the first steps of the human explorers that would step upon its shores and overturn 2,000 years of thinking on the natural world. The year is 326 BC, and Alexander the Great stares across the Indus River into the unknown lands. For the last 10 years of his life, he has led the armies of Greece on their conquest of the Eastern Mediterranean. His newly forged empire stretches from the Adriatic Sea to the Indus River. He's at the peak of his power. In that moment, he is commanding the single most powerful military force that has walked the earth in human history. They're going on an expedition into India in search of the ends of the earth and that great outer sea the ancients believed encircled all the lands of the world. And he will fail. <laughs> On the far side of the Mediterranean, in a town we now call Marseille, is another man, a man named Pythias. And he couldn't have been more different than Alexander. You see, where Alexander the Great was tutored by Aristotle himself until the age of 16 and raised by the shrewdest politician in Greek history, Pythias? Pythias was so poor that historians writing 200 years after he died would joke about it. But where Alexander the Great failed, Pythias succeeded. Not only did Pythias sail beyond the known world into the outer sea, he was the first person in recorded history to sail all the way around the British Isles. But Pythias didn't stop there. When he was at the northernmost tip of the British Isles, he made a decision that changed history. He decided to sail north from Scotland into the open ocean. Okay, we, sorry, we need to stop because you don't understand how crazy that is. <laughs> Pythias, he was a sailor in the Bronze Age. For most men of his time, sailing out of sight of land was grounds for mutiny. Their ships were called Pentaconters. <laughs> That's right, Pentaconters. 50 men at oars without even a deck and fixed sails. There were no compasses, no astrolabes. People wouldn't figure out that longitude was a thing for a thousand years. That's right. Pythias decided to sail north from Scotland, and that was insane. No one had been there before. This would be like, I don't know, blowing up a swan pool floaty and deciding to fly it to the moon. <laughs> but really, not, not even the moon, because if you're going to fly a swan pool floaty to the moon, you could at least see what you were aiming at. Uh, by the way, um, this voyage is so important that it's a side note that Pythias is the first person to realize that the tides were connected to the position of the moon. Don't worry about that. <laughs> as far as Pythias knew, in fact, as far as anyone in the ancient world knew, there was no moon beyond the British Isles to aim for. That was the ends of the earth. After that, who knows? Sure, there were, there were some Greeks like Pythagoras and Aristotle that thought that the earth might be a sphere, but it was just as common to believe that the entire world was a ziggurat on the back of a turtle. That's right, turtle set. So like I said, Pythias' decision to sail north from the British island, it was insane. To go back to our analogy, this is more like taking your swan pool floaty and shooting it into the voids of space, crossing your fingers that you hit something before you start. And you know what? Pythias did it. I mean, he, he found a land of ice. One might call it an Iceland. 
That's right, six days north of the British Isles, he found a land that he called Thule. The trip in, taught him important lessons. Uh, it turns out the North Star, yeah, uh, when you get close to the pole, it doesn't show true north. You actually have to take a different constellation of three other stars and then draw a hypothetical rectangle and just imagine a star in that fourth corner. Yeah, that, that's true north up there. Pythias, he had to figure that shit out just to get home. But once he got home is when the trouble really started. You see, he'd had this incredible, life-changing, worldview-shattering experience. He had literally sailed to the ends of the earth and then decided to go one day further for the heck of it. He saw crazy things. He reported days that lasted 22 hours. He reported oceans that had their surfaces freeze so that the ice looked like a swarm of jellyfish. For educated men, born in the warm climates of the Mediterranean, these observations of the world beyond the pillars of Hercules defied common sense. They knew in their bones that oceans don't freeze, that night follows day. As Strabo, the first and frankly most famous Roman geographer who wrote in the first century AD, said, how could we possibly believe someone whose observations are so different from what we know about the world. After all, Pythias claimed all kinds of crazy things, like saying Marseille wasn't very far south of Byzantium. It, it's not. <laughs> or claiming that Britain was taller than it was wide. It is. And, and Strabo would come back again and again to those craziest of observations, the idea of seas that froze and suns that shone at midnight. And here's the most messed up thing. Pythias, he was really good at... That's right. In fact, it, that's part of what pissed off Strabo. You see, he didn't hesitate to use the accuracy of his measurements and observations against Pythias. That's why he would write in his Geographica, it is because of men's ignorance that any heed has been given to those who created the mythical lands and also to all those false statements made by Pythias the Messalian regarding the country along the oceans, wherein he uses as a screen his scientific knowledge of astronomy and mathematics. <laughs> Look, they can't argue with his meticulous measurement, so Strabo and his hero, the Greek historian Polybius, they, they cite to Pythias over and over, but every time they do, it's to call him a liar and a charlatan, and they're, they're powerful enemies to have. You see, the force of their combined criticism moved Pythias and his journey from the lands of geography and science to the realms of myth and fantasy. In fact, the Roman poets, Virgil and Seneca, they took Thule as, as just a metaphor, as a phrase, a figure of speech for the farthest possible place Sort of like we may use the phrase, from here to Timbuktu. And so for the next 1,800 years, that's where Thule remained, in that realm of myth and fantasy. Since the copy of Pythias' actual book, On the Oceans, was lost when the great library at Alexandria was burned in 276 AD, we might have lost all trace of this early explorer if not for this lateral move into literature. But that literary fascination with the idea of a fantastical, unknown land in the utmost north, it kept the idea of, of Thule and Pythias alive. By 1477, Christopher Columbus was claiming to have sailed to Thule. He didn't. By the late 1600s, nearly 2,000 years after his original voyage, Alexander Pope and Sir Richard Blackmore were still using Thule in their poems. By the 1800s, Charlotte Bronte, writing about Jane Eyre, would use her reading books on Thule to capture her isolation. And Herman Melville, he'd invent this character, the king of Thule, in his work, The New Ancient of Days. From Edgar Allan Poe to E.E. E. Cummings, Authors and poets throughout the Western world drew upon this idea of Thule, the unknown land discovered by Pythias, as a source of inspiration. And so it was that in the 19th century, 
when technology and inclination and motivation came together to drive the earliest polar explorers once again into that utmost north, Pythias and Thule were waiting. Having survived in the shadowy realms of fiction, modern scholars took those very same observations that had labeled Pythias a liar and a charlatan to his ancient contemporaries as the best evidence that he had personally explored beyond Iceland into the Arctic Circle itself. His account of 22-hour days and ice flows, of impassable congealed waters and impenetrable fogs, they so matched the experience of explorers like Nansen that Pythias experienced a rebirth in the course of a mere 50 years from expeditions like Nansen's to the voyages of Sir Richard Francis Burton, Pythias was transformed from a liar to a legend. And so it was that by 1942, Pythias's journey was unanimously accepted as accurate and truthful by modern scholars. The circumpolar explorer Vialmer Stephenson described Pythias this way. He has been referred to as a Columbus with a flavor of Darwin. He seems to have been more nearly a composite of James Cook and Galileo. So, let's raise a toast to Pythias and Ultima Thule, to journeys into unknown lands, and to surviving in the quotations of your enemies until history catches up with you.